25, we're bringing, as you know, a series of messages on the tabernacles in the wilderness. This is the 12th message. And uh, this message has to do with the Ark of the Covenant. Exodus chapter 25, and we'll begin reading at verse 10. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be borne with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them, in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. <coughs> and the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another, toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things, which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Without too much review on the subject of the tabernacle, this strange building, which we have drawn a likeness of on this chart, was to be a dwelling place for Jehovah during the wilderness journeys of Israel. It was to be more than a dwelling place for the Lord. It was to be a place of communion, a place of meeting, a place where he met with man and a place where he communed with man. Even though man was sinful and separated from God, God had devised a way and so revealed it to Moses on the mount of meeting even with sinful man. For back in the last room of this strange building, the little room, 15 foot square, known as the holiest of all, God had ordered a small chest to be built. This chest was only 27 inches wide and it was 27 inches high. And it was 45 inches long, very strange box indeed, made of acacia wood, a desert wood, and overlaid with purest gold. Around the top edge of this box was a golden crown. And the lid of this box had no wood in it at all, but was made of the purest beaten gold, a lid of solid gold. And on either end of this large slab of wood, 45 or gold, 45 inches long, there was molded an image of a cherubim. Now what these cherubims are, I can't tell you, excepting they are the living creatures of the book of Revelation. And they are the same cherubims described by Ezekiel and Isaiah who saw them. They have something to do with the holiness of God. They're angelic creatures. They have six wings, two to fly with, two to cover their feet with and two to cover their face with. And whenever they make any sound at all, the voice that comes from these cherubims cry, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. They have to do with the complete holiness of God and they are the guardians of his throne. And these two golden cherubims whose wings met over the mercy seat were the guardians of this golden throne placed in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle building. This golden seat called the mercy seat or mercy throne was to be the place of meeting between God and man. 
But the box it covered is the object of our attention tonight. And a strange box indeed it was. First of all, it occupied the most holy spot on earth. When the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness, God was present with them. He manifested his presence by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. None could doubt the presence of Jehovah, hovering day and night over the holiest of all in this strange tent building, was the huge pillar of cloud which reached up to heaven, manifested the presence of Jehovah. Suddenly that cloud would move. If it were at night it appeared in the form of fire. And if it moved, all Israel knew that they were to move when the pillar moved. So if God led them, he led them by the pillar of fire at night and the pillar of cloud by day. And the high priest watched that pillar day and night. And if it moved, the tent was taken down. And Israel struck their tents. For they were a wilderness people, a people on the march. And every part of this great place of communion was temporary. For God ever wanted them to remember that they were strangers and pilgrims in the land. And that one day he would bring them to a permanent resting place, into a large land which flowed with milk and honey and to a large city named Jerusalem where he put his name and where he promised to establish a permanent dwelling place and meeting place between him and man. And all of this is instructive for the believer. For when we come to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, we read that all of this was God's picture story language depicting the work, the ministry, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is the tabernacle. He is the only meeting place now between God and man. He is the brazen altar where the sin offering was slain. He is the labor of cleansing where the New Testament priesthood ever are kept cleansed by the precious blood. He is the golden candlestick, the light in which we walk. He is the table of showbread, the bread from heaven upon which we feast. He is the golden altar of incense where we are privileged to make known the deep desires of our heart before God in an acceptable fashion. He is the veil that stands between man and God. For the writer of Hebrews assures us that the veil is now his flesh, and the flesh of Jesus the body of Christ is the only thing that stands between the world and God. To go to God, man must come through this veil. And that veil was rent in two, it was torn at Calvary. And the wounds are still in his hands and in his feet and side to show that the veil has been rent and the way is open to God. He is the ark of the covenant. He is the blood-sprinkled mercy seat. For when he comes again, John on the Isle of Patmos, who saw in a prophetic vision the coming of the Lord, said that when he came again, his vesture was dipped in blood. And upon his thigh was a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He called him the word of God and faithful and true. But all this bloody dark reminds us that still he is the blood-sprinkled mercy seat by which men come to God. He is crowned as the Ark of the Covenant is crowned with the golden crown. For God has given him a name which is above every name. And someday when he comes, as John saw him upon his brow, will be many crowns. For he will be King of the Kings and Lord of the Lords. We must never, in studying the tabernacle in the wilderness, be satisfied for a study of the tabernacle. We're not interested in dimensions. We're not interested in facts and figures concerning an ancient building which has long since rotted and decayed. Our interest is the interest of the Holy Spirit in seeing in what fashion and in what manner the Lord Jesus Christ has been foreshadowed in these Old Testament truths. The Holy Spirit, who is the author of Scripture, wrote this wonderful book through many writers indeed, but the theme was always the same. 
the theme was Christ. For in John's Gospel, chapter 1, we are assured that the Word of God is the Lord Jesus. And He is God, and yet He was made manifest in the flesh. And so the whole testimony of the Word of God is the testimony of Christ. And when we read God's Word, if we come away without seeing Him or His things, Indeed, we have not seen what the Holy Spirit has written. For the Holy Spirit has written the testimony of Christ in every page and in every detail. I am satisfied that if the Ark of the Covenant means anything, if it is fulfilled in New Testament language, it is fulfilled in the person work of Christ himself. First of all, one of the strange things about this Ark, I think you'll notice in this text, I said it occupied the holiest place of all. Do you realize that no man was ever allowed to see this strange box excepting the high priest? It was kept behind the veil back here in the Holy of Holies. And when Israel moved, the first thing the high priest did was remove the great veil which hung between the holy place and the Holy of Holies. And he took this great veil, which had the cherubims embroidered in gold, and he wrapped the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat in it. Only the handles of the staves extended beyond the veil. And over this veil, the badger skin covering was taken from the tabernacle in place. And over the badger skin went a blue cloth covering. So that when Israel marched at the very head of the procession went the Ark of the Covenant, but it was veiled. It was hidden from the eyes of the world. No man could see the Ark of the Covenant save those who knew about it by faith. And so even in this, the fulfillment of this wonderful box must be found in the work of Christ. Christ veiled to the world, yet seen clearly by the eye of faith. Isn't it strange that after the resurrection from the dead, no man saw Christ but his believers? Many of them saw him. He showed himself alive by many infallible proofs after the erect, uh, resurrection. In fact, 500 brethren saw him at once in Galilee. He walked and talked with the saints for 40 days and nights conversed with them freely, offered oftentimes his wounded hands and side for them to touch and to satisfy their troubled hearts that it was really he himself. Yet not a single unbeliever ever saw him. No sinner ever laid their eyes on the resurrected Jesus. And even though that phenomenal ascension took place on the Mount of Olives, when all the world could have seen, yet he was veiled from their view. He ascended to God's throne, to the right hand of the Father. A cloud received him out of their sight. But it is not written that every eye saw him. For he has been veiled from view and shall be veiled until that day when he shall come in glory. And in that day when he declares his Father's glory and his own rights to the kingdoms of this world, he will be hidden, save to the eye of faith. Yet for 19 centuries, men have seen him. Indeed, they have seen him in the pages of the Word of God. They have seen him with the eyes of faith. They have seen him in such an unmistakable manner that no man shall ever take from them the vision that they have had of Christ. I was thinking today, in a rather abstract way, what a strange phenomenon. I was looking back over my own life, now 17 years since, and I was trying to pick a suitable word today for what happened to me 17 years ago, 17 years since I first encountered since I first met, since I first saw, since I first was made to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. I've never seen him 
with my real eyes and I've never touched him with my hands and I've never heard his voice in an audible way yet he is as real to me and more so than you people in this building tonight 17 years of reality what a phenomenon I thought today that for 17 years my life has revolved around a person I have never seen I have moved at the direction of his voice yet I have never heard it my heart has been filled with his love what a phenomenon that for 19 centuries millions of people have seen him have known him and yet not so phenomenal if you believe the word of God for in the gospel of John he uttered this promise if any man will love me and keep my commandments I and my father will come unto him take up our abode in him and we shall manifest ourselves unto him isn't that a wonderful promise do you know that only the priests ever saw this ark yet it was as real to that priest as his own arms and legs I've often wondered what it must have been like in enemy territory as they marched and their enemies derided them saying what do you have under those racks what's in this strange badger skin and blue veil that you have here and the old priest says we have the ark of the testimony of God we have the very meeting place where God meets man we have the blood sprinkled mercy seat of purest beaten gold where two cherubims always look down upon that precious incorruptible blood and where peace is always spoken for the sinner's heart and I hear those enemies say well show it to me oh no you cannot see it unless you see it by faith once a man said to me in a place of business as I spoke of Christ show me your Christ and I'll believe on him for this is ever the way of the world they cannot receive him for they cannot see him. but the priest knew of the reality of the ark he had seen its mercy seat sprinkled too often with the precious blood of redemption to ever doubt what was beneath that thing and even though for a season Christ is veiled from the believer we are as sure of this blood sprinkled mercy seat as though we had touched it with our hands and seen it with our eyes and another one of the strange things of this ark which makes me positive that it must be fulfilled in Christ is the fact that the ark itself was made of gold and wood now it was a desert wood the acacia tree and it was overlaid with pure gold the wood couldn't be seen but it was there and you couldn't say it was a golden box because it was a golden and wooden box and you couldn't say it was a wooden box for it was wood and gold alike it was not all wood and it was not all gold but it was gold and wood and this speaks to me at least of the person of Christ for when he was here we read in the New Testament that he was man and yet he was God well it's the mystery it's the mystery of the incarnation and referred to by Paul in his first letter to Timothy as the mystery of godliness God manifest in the flesh God tabernacled the Greek says in John 1 among us he tabernacled in an earthly body he was made in the likeness of man not like an angel Paul says in Hebrews but in the likeness of sinful man and for a season he might be identified with man yet in all of his earthly ministry and yea even in his death he was perfect God very God of very God not a thing was limited in the divine personality of Christ not a thing was limited in his deity he was still the creator that he was before he entered the earthly body prepared for him in the womb of Mary he was still the mighty son of God 
the blessed word of God now made incarnate, yet at the same time he was man. He had to be, for he was to be the meeting place between man and God. He had to be God, for no man could die in the place of sinners save him whose blood was incorruptible and holy and divine and eternal. No man could die for sinners save he who was sinless and without spot and without blemish. So he must be God, but yet he must also be man. For he came to be identified with man and to take upon himself the sins of man and to answer for man in man's place. So as man he must be in the place of death. God cannot die. So God must put himself in that place of death. So he was made for a season in the likeness of man. No wonder then. He is the perfect meeting place between man and God, for he not only thinks as God thinks, he can also feel with us in our infirmity. You know, when you read about the Lord Jesus, you see this, I don't know what you call it, I've often called it these flashes of deity in his ministry. There was a time when he just spoke to a troubled sea and it lay calm and he spoke to the wind and said, Be still, and it was quiet. And that was God. That was God the Creator speaking to that which he had created in perfect command of every force of nature. And in every perfect situation, he was in perfect control of everything over which he had made. Yet, I see him on other occasions when he reacts as a man. I see him tired and he lays down to rest in the back of the ship while others fret. We see him hungry and he stops to take bread. We see him heart heavy, burdened, with soul so heavy, even as it were unto death in the Garden of Gethsemane. We see him weep. Weeping at Lazarus' tomb, weeping over a multitude that had not been fed, weeping over Jerusalem because their house was desolate, because they turned him away. We see him shed tears, we see him tired, we see him hungry, thirsty, we see him in the wilderness tempted as a man, in all points like as we are yet without sin. Yet we see him touch a leper and make him clean speak in the eyes of a blind man are open, stand by the tomb and cry for Lazarus, and he comes forth after four days of death. Perfect God and perfect man. And everything he did, dear brethren, he did in subjection to the Holy Spirit of God, that he might live among us as a man and die sinless as our substitute and as our sin offer. And when this miracle of the gold and wooden box becomes clear to you. The ministry, the high priestly ministry of Christ in the glory will be much more precious to you. One of the heartaches of life, one of the burdens of the way, is our inability to communicate the burden of our heart with others. There are times when it is impossible no matter how close a man and woman may be as husband and wife, no matter how close a father and son, a mother and daughter, no matter how close an earthly relationship we may have here, even in the body of Christ there are times when all human language is beggared to describe what we feel in our hearts, what we experience down deep inside where no man can see, there are often times when we must be content to be misunderstood. We must be content to be blamed when we are blameless. We must be content from time to time to bear our sorrows alone. And if, as I say, the mystery of the golden wood covenant box 
as seen in the Lord Jesus Christ is ever made real clear to you oh what a joy it will be to you for you will remember him who is now at the right hand of God interceding for us who have come to God by him and this high priest the writer of Hebrews says is a merciful high priest the Greek says he is a compassionate a loving and compassionate high priest who is able hear this able to be touched with the feelings of our infirmities now infirmities are weaknesses and in these times when we cannot communicate with others and the burden is much heavier when we feel that no one understands oh what a joy it is to know that Jesus understands he does not express sympathy towards his people sympathy comes from a word sympathio which means it comes from the head uh, it's a thing which is connected with the feelings of a man uh, and it's described by something like I can feel for you but I can't reach you I understand up here what you're going through with but it doesn't make any impression on me down in my heart I can't share with you in this suffering I understand it up here I can look on like Job's comforters and I can sit in stony silence because I am I'm convinced that you're in great need but I can't reach you in that need but compassion compassion is something else and it was only manifested in the New Testament by Christ himself until the Holy Spirit indwelt God's people and then it was also manifest in his people compassion comes from a word the root of which our word spleen comes and the spleen was considered to be the deepest part of a man and the word compassion means to come out of the bowels of a man and it means to enter so into the troubles and the needs and the burdens of another that we actually experience with them what they are experiencing that's hard to describe isn't it but this is compassion it's what Paul felt when he looked upon his lost kinsman his brethren according to the flesh and he wept and he cried to God oh I could wish myself a curse from Christ that they might be saved he so felt what they felt in their lost condition so entered into their sufferings with his own soul that he agonized in their lost condition with them to the point that he was willing to be damned if they might be saved and delivered from their state of unbelief this is compassion it was what Jesus manifested when he looked upon the widow's son dead and he saw the widow weeping strange he looked upon the dead son he didn't do anything but he looked upon the weeping mother and he was moved with compassion now the writer of Hebrews getting back to the our text states that Jesus is a merciful and compassionate a loving and compassionate high priest able to be touched with the feelings of our infirmities there's no such thing of coming to Jesus telling him what's in our hearts and having him say with a pat on the head I understand I don't know exactly what you're going through but it must be some deep dark trouble and I will remember you in prayer no no Jesus does not sit idly by and look upon us in our need he suffers with us we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh and everything you are experiencing tonight he is experiencing with you and he understands you're tired well he was tired too he was so tired from ministry all day long standing in the hot sun preaching teaching blessing the little children picking them up in his arms he ministered the word one day I recall clear through the meal time 
The disciples had hastened off to Samaria to get something to eat. It was dinner time. They worked by the watch. Not Jesus. He had to go through Samaria and rest on the curbstone of Jacob's well because there was a woman who was in deep sin and who was in great need. You're hungry? He knew what it meant to be hungry. Forty days and nights in the wilderness he went without food. He knows what it means to be tired. He knows what it means to be so tormented in mind, so derided and persecuted and hated by even the members of his own household. But if you'll read the 69th Psalm, which is a messianic psalm, you'll read of some of the agonies of Jesus' heart while he lived with Mary and Joseph, when his own brethren mocked him, and when he sorrowed and wept before God in prayer and made fun of his spiritual agony. And many a night the Lord Jesus knew what it meant to turn his face to the wall and not a human soul on earth to comfort him in his great need. But he had his father. And so many the night that was spent in prayer, in fellowship and communion with this one who did know and who did understand. Now Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. He spoke of the Holy Spirit indwelling us who would make real his high priestly ministry to us. And if there's anything that ought to encourage you and ought to bless your heart, it's this, that when no man understands, he does understand, and he suffers with you in whatever current trial you may be in. And when I think of this loving and compassionate high priest, I'm reminded of the Old Testament story of how Hannah came into the temple of old. Hannah, who wanted more than anything in the world to have a son. Hannah, who was barren. And Hannah, who had such a burden that not even her husband, he was a godly man, and he loved the Lord, and he loved Hannah. But even her husband couldn't understand the burden of Hannah's heart. Because one day he came home, and he said to her, Well, Hannah, you haven't eaten anything. You're looking bad. What's the matter with you? You don't eat. You don't sleep. What's wrong? And she rushed out and ran to the temple weeping, for he couldn't understand. She tried to tell him, and he said, Well, look at me. Aren't I better to you than seven sons? He couldn't understand. He wasn't touched with the feelings of her infirmity, but she went to the temple. She began to sob and to cry and to pray to God. And old Eli, who was the priest of the temple, overheard. And he came in and asked her why she wept. She told him, but Eli couldn't understand it either. And Eli had to turn away and leave her alone with the Lord. And there, with only God to understand, she poured out her heart. And God only understood, heard, and he answered. And he gave to Hannah the desire of her heart, which was a son. His name was Samuel. And I think now that this will never be repeated. No child of God today will ever run into the presence of God weeping to hear the high priest say, I don't understand why you're weeping. The high priest understands. He knows. Even though at Gethsemane, in the hour of his greatest need, when he longed for human fellowship and no man stood with him, yea, they slept while he prayed. He knew the fellowship of the Lord. And now he has become to us one who understands us. And I don't know what that means to you, but it's been one of my great frustrations in my life is the realization that there isn't anyone who does really understand what I'm like and what I feel and what I think, what hurts me and what burdens me, what makes me heavy, what weights me down. There isn't anyone who really understands, but Jesus understands. And that's why we sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. This is the mystery of his incarnation, one glorious fruit of it, by the fact that he was God and man. It is a comfort to my heart. He understands me, yet at the same time, he can act for me from God's side. For the priest was not God's representative, he was man's representative. 
Jesus is on our side and he's in the glory to convey to the Father all that is upon our hearts and to obtain through his momentary intercession and intervention in our lives the will of God. Now let's go on with the Ark of the Covenant. There's another thing about this Ark which is precious. You'll notice they cast four rings. They put a ring in each corner of the Ark. Then they made two staves of desert wood and they overlaid them with gold and they stuck them through the rings on the Ark. That's what these little brown things are supposed to be here on the chart. Two staves or poles if you will please and these poles once thrust through these two rings on either side of the Ark of the Covenant were never to be removed and God's instruction was the Ark was to be born with them it was to go wherever they went now you'll see we are still on the same subject the Lord Jesus goes with us wherever we go no matter where we go, he goes with us. No matter what our circumstances, he is with us. What a comfort it should be to your heart tonight. The promise of the word of God says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Fear not what man shall do unto thee, for he himself, Paul quotes this again in Hebrews, hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He's with us. There are times when we're not sure he's with us. There's times when we don't feel like he's with us. There's times when we don't even think he's with us. There's times when we have no idea that he's with us, but he's with us. One of these times came to Paul in his earthly ministry when he was at Corinth. Eighteen months he ministered the word there. Corinth was a terrible hard place a seaport town where men were ungodly to the nth degree, haters of God and idolaters and filthy, profane people about him. Yet for 18 months he preached the word until he became so discouraged, so heartsick, that he was sure the Lord had even deserted him. And in a night, the Lord Jesus manifested himself to him and told him, I am with you, Paul. Now you be encouraged because I have much people in this city. And Paul went about his business in courage. And so it was on the ship when he was sailing to Rome that the ship was about to go down. And all the sailors and all the passengers despaired, of their, despaired and uh, gave up any thought of saving their lives. But Paul was of good cheer and they couldn't understand this. And they couldn't eat. They couldn't sleep. They were all shook up. Paul was eating. He was in perfect control of himself. And he finally said to them, Be of good cheer, for the Lord has promised. I believe, God, it will be just as he said. And the Lord had manifested himself to Paul, and he was with him right there on the ship. And not a single soul would perish on that ship. He would bring them into their desired haven, and he did. This ark was to go with God's people wherever they went. They went into war, he was with them. In peace, he was with them. In hunger, when they abounded, he was with them. In sickness and in health, for better, for worse, and death could never part them, this ark was carried with them wherever they went. God had appointed priests. Wherever Israel went, those priests bore that ark. That ark had to go. And it went always before them, never behind them. Always the ark went on before and charted the course, made sure that the way was safe. God's people walked through that wilderness for 40 years just following the ark. The ark was always with them. It's a wonderful ark. It just has to be Christ. He's with us. We're following him through this wilderness walk in every circumstance. He'll be there ahead of us. When I was traveling, a lot of verse of scripture which was precious to me was that when he puts forth his sheep, he goeth before them. Many and many a time, I've gone someplace to minister the word, to be many miles from home and in a strange place and wonder if it were hostile or friendly and have this assurance from him, I've gone before you. I've already prepared the way. Hearts have already been touched and doors have already been opened. And you'll see 
and all the times have come to pass that I have seen. I've gone into homes that I've never been into before, and I've sensed the presence of the Lord already there before me, preparing the way, making things easy for me, opening the hearts of people, working miracles and solving problems, and proving to me every step of the way that he had already gone ahead of me. <laughs> well, I saw it just this week in the little details of this moving of the book ministry from one building to another. Why, as I went about the work of getting partitions in and making offices and things of that nature, I found that the Lord had already been there before me and had worked out the details long before I'd ever arrived and assured me that he was there before I got there. What a wonderful assurance to know. Wherever we go, he's with us. This was a wonderful ark. Do you know that when they finally came to the end of their wilderness journey, and they went to cross into the promised land, and they came to the river Jordan, and they were afraid. They'd never seen anything like this. Oh, they had crossed the Red Sea by faith, but... That had been so many years before, and those who had crossed the Red Sea had perished in the wilderness, and this was a new generation. Only Caleb and Joshua were left now of that old generation that had come out of Egypt. Forty years ago, yes, they could have crossed the Red Sea and Jordan too, but now, a new generation. They were afraid when they saw the waters of Jordan because they were in flood stage. They were turbulent. They were fearful. They feared for their lives, and the people camped on the side of Jordan and wondered, how shall we ever cross this impassable water? And God instructed Joshua, tell the priests to take the ark, bear it on their shoulders, and when the soles of the priests' feet touch the waters of Jordan, they'll roll back. And so these priests gathered up the ark of the covenant, and they put it on their shoulders, and they started, and they got down to Jordan, and I can just see them in my mind's eye sometimes standing there, looking at the waters, and then looking at the ark. But this is God's ark. This is his testimony. This is his blood-sprinkled mercy seat. He will not let it perish. We bear this ark with us, and if we perish, God's testimony shall perish. So timidly they struck one foot into the water, and lo and behold, when the sole of their foot touched the water of Jordan, it rolled back in a heap. This ark was a terror to their enemies. The Philistines stole it. They were glad to get rid of it. It was life to some, and it was death to others. Eli fell off his chair backwards and died when he heard that the Philistines had captured the ark. His grandson was named Ichabod because the ark was gone, and Ichabod means the glory has departed. This was more than the testimony of God. It was the glory of God in the midst of his people. It was Christ his Son, seen in Old Testament picture language. And wherever they carried that ark, their enemies fled. Waters rolled back. Enemies died. And the heathen God fell off his pedestal and broke his neck at the very sight of the ark of the covenant. This is Christ. <coughs> And let me tell you one of the grandest surprises of heaven will be when we see our lives as they have really been. And when we see the enemies that have been defeated, the impassable waters that have rolled back because of the presence of Christ in our hearts, when we have seen the snares that we have avoided because the ark was in our midst, when we see the long, hard trek that we have made through this wilderness, and when we see what God sees now in our lives, when we see the dangers that we have passed through these very 24 hours that have just closed, I think our song throughout eternity will just have to be amazing grace. Won't it be? How sweet the sound. And maybe that verse, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come, was grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace has brought me home. And I never think along this line, and I don't think of that old man that I've mentioned to you so often. One time, I heard a pastor call upon an old man in the congregation to pray, had long bib overalls on. He got down on his knees in the aisle. And he prayed. 
two things he said I've never forgotten one of them was this he thanked the Lord for the dangers seen and unseen that the Lord had delivered him out of that very day and I had never thought to thank God for the unseen dangers I'd always thanked him for those things I'd seen and he had delivered me from but from that day on my heart was made glad for the multitude of Satan's host that camped about me yet not a hair of my head perished not one inch of the hedge which he set about me had been broken through and the second thing that old man said that stayed with me through all these years was when he went to say amen to his prayer he didn't say uh, any fancy clothes he just said well Lord I'll be talking to you again after a while goodbye that's all he said the Lord Jesus is with us his hand is ever upon us he indwells us we murmur and complain and oftentimes think he has forgotten us indeed it is because of a sluggish heart of unbelief that we have not seen his hand in every detail of our lives this very day this ark went wherever Israel went in battle and in peace and in sickness and in health in the presence of enemies and in the presence of friends protecting them guiding them leading them guarding them empowering them helping them comforting them it made every one of the saints of God rejoice the whole city shouted the praises of God and joy when David brought the ark of the covenant into the city of Jerusalem and truly this is Christ for in him every saint of God rejoices and in him every victory that is won is won and every enemy that is defeated is defeated in him and every path in which we are led of righteousness for his name's sake we have been led by this precious and glorious ark of the covenant I think we've just stopped here tonight this is just one third of the message so I think we'll just stop here tonight and next Thursday night this sounds like the close of an Uncle Wiggly story but next Thursday night if it's not snowing and you're all here and we're still here and the Lord doesn't come and we don't meet in the air before then we'd like to take up at this point and we'll talk about the contents of this ark precious contents in the ark three things in the ark all of these three things speak of Christ in the ark were the tables of stone given to Moses on Mount Sinai in the ark was a golden pot and it was filled with what manna and then there was a third article it was a rod a mysterious rod a rod even though it was dead it was a stick a dead branch yet this branch budded and it brought forth more buds and then it blossomed and then it brought forth fruit and this was called the rod of Aaron and the rod of Aaron was in the ark along with the tables of stone and the golden pot and I can't wait till next week to tell you this all of these three things speak of his death burial and his resurrection all of the curse and all of the wrath of the law fell upon the Lord Jesus delivered him to the death of Calvary's cross but in the man I have seen the mysterious facet of the gospel known as the burial and the world knows so little about it and in the rod that budded we have the glorious resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ a dead branch yet a branch that came to life and did more than come to life bless your heart this branch was root in himself for he budded and then he blossomed and then he brought forth fruit and there were others who came from that branch as he had come and that's us shall we pray our father we rejoice and thank thee tonight for this wonderful person of the Lord Jesus Christ indeed we lay at thy feet tonight with the realization that he alone is worthy of our praise our thanksgiving and oh father how we are provoked as we hear again from thy word the glories of the Son to lay at his feet what is left of these lives Oh, keep us, Father, from holding back any alabaster box for ourselves. 
but to lay at his precious feet our lives for his glory and his praise. May the Spirit of God magnify in our hearts this wonderful person. And as we prayed before this meeting, so we pray now. May we leave this building with our more than our heads filled with facts and figures, religious facts and information, no matter how interesting they may be, but help us to leave with our hearts and eyes fixed upon Jesus, seeing him in his loveliness, longing for his fellowship as never before. Show us the difference, Father, between mere religious information and preaching that is of the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Teach us the difference between hearing the shepherd's voice, the great shepherd's voice in the Word, and hearing merely that tinkling cymbal and sounding brass, that dispenser of religious information that we hear so much on every hand today. God, give us a desire to know Christ and to be jealous for nothing but his good name and to seek the fellowship of all those who know the preciousness of his blood on these grounds alone. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you.